people often ask what it was like working on the Flint water situation. And I usually say three things. It was humbling, it was hard, and it was heartbreaking. It was humbling in the fact that I did not know all the things that I did not know about the intricacies of corrosion control and the lead copper rule and other such things. It was hard. Uh, for the first four months of the event, I worked in the Unified Command Center, um, Unified Coordination Center rather, with all the state and federal partners in Flint. And people spit at us, people yelled at us, and we had to be escorted to our cars by the police or the National Guard. It was a tough, hard situation. I didn't wear my DEQ shirt, I'll tell you that. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking um, to see a lot of good people who were just doing their jobs, who've been hurt by this. Some of the long-term ramifications of all of that are yet to be determined. But still, they're already hurt. And it was heartbreaking to see the people of Flint, who certainly, there was hurt there, don't get me wrong, but there also was a tremendous amount of hype that hurt them even more than the actual event. I'm convinced of that, too. Some other confounding factors going on that you never hear anybody talk about. Never did. The winters of 2014 and 2015 were some of the coldest on record in the Midwest. So there was an excessive number of water main breaks in all water systems, not just Flint. But especially in Flint, because several reasons. Oversized water system. Very little capital investment in the last 20 years. And so they had an excessive number of water main breaks in those years. Now, you can have the most perfect, non corrosive water in the world, however you choose to define that. And if you have water main breaks, extreme velocities, changes in flow directions, it's going to strip every coating we've created off those pipes over the last several decades. This is a major cause of the event. It's the raw river water, and it was actually less corrosive than the water they were receiving from Great Lakes Water Authority in Detroit. Now, the treated water, the green lines on the bottom, was indeed corrosive. So I don't want to miss that important point. This was a human-made event, okay? We think that the Flint event occurred from April 2014, when they first started treating water, until October 2015, when they went back on Gleevo water. And it was all really corrosive and bad at that time. Not true. In fact, particularly during that early time and those early monitoring periods we showed, it wasn't that bad. It didn't become really bad until you know, that summer of 2015. And it actually, in terms of tap monitoring, became worse when they went back on Detroit water. I'll let you think about why that is here. In a minute. <laughs> it was not while they were on river water. Um, so, how many times have you heard on the news, whoever it was who decided not to add one part per million of phosphate to the water, be it the DEQ, be it the water plant, be it the manager, whoever it was, they're the guilty party and they caused all this corrosivity stuff to happen. How many times have you heard that? Yeah, thousands. Not true. Not true. Phosphate is certainly one of many corrosivity factors that affect water. And it certainly would have had some impact, but I don't believe it would have prevented this event. You know what the city of Flint is maintaining for a phosphate level right now in their distribution system? 
3.1 milligrams per liter. 3.1. I don't think one would have made any difference at all. Any measurable difference, I really don't. But all these other things affect corrosivity. That's why, you know, unfortunately, we like to simplify things into one or two things for a short message. Water treatment is really complicated. And there's one other really big one, which nobody ever talks about. And that is contact time. And that is one of the reasons, in my opinion, why the very worst tap sample results occurred in 2016 after they were back on Detroit water. Because what happened at that time? What people, people quit using the water. And so as soon as that emergency order was declared in January of 2016, people wouldn't drink the water, they wouldn't bathe in the water, they wouldn't use the water. The contact time in those houses that were getting sampled was weeks old in some cases. And so we actually have the worst, the highest lead sample results after they're back on Detroit water than during the event itself. Now they weren't supposed to be making the water, so that's a good thing. But it's incredible how people have interpreted those emergency directives and have if you will, prolong the recovery of the system. As a result, I read a newspaper article recently, some guy was still flushing his toilet with bottled water. I said, why? But I mean, this is the kind of thing that's going on to this very day. Another issue that most people don't mention is the effect of change on corrosivity, and stirring up sediments and stripping coatings. And so in between those bars there are essentially, is essentially the period of time when that water plant was operating. And you notice how they're on the gas, off the gas. It's like there was no steady operation of that water plant during that period of time. And I've often said water distribution systems are like orthodox people. They hate change. They hate change. And even if that change is in the right direction, the constant change stirs things up, strips lines, and makes things worse. And so that's another factor that you never hear about. But I think it's important. And I say this with all due respect. But the water plant operators had no real long-term experience operating that water plant. And so when something would change, and they would react to it, maybe overreact to it. Then, oh, see. There's a lot of that going on. And the things, they're not the kind of things you typically hear about, right? Why? Because <laughs> they're complicated. Um, you know, it's much easier to say, you didn't have one part per million of phosphate, therefore this caused all this grief. But there's been so much study and so much review of it by now. Why, the, why has that not been, has that not been part of the reports that have come out? Is that, I mean, does the, the interagency commission, has the task force not communicated that? Have they not looked at it? Some of them have individually, yes, but it's not a part of any official report that I know. So let's put it down. There were so many things, as you saw, that contributed to the event. I don't think, I don't think any person could have orchestrated this if they'd tried. You know, you heard that earlier in the event that somehow somebody tried to make this happen. Really? How could you possibly control all those things? You know. Um, it's like when an airplane crashes, three, four, five, or a dozen things go wrong all at the same time. That's what happened to Cliff. A number of things went wrong. I don't think anybody could have predicted it. I really don't. So I, I think it's an anomaly. I, I pray it's an anomaly. 